So hello everyone, my name is Jakub. I am software engineer in Outreach. I'm working uh, louder. Oh, so I'm working on the front-end part, but I have a lot of experience with designing applications from back-end and front-end as well. So today I will be talking about scaling up the front-end part of your application. I'll be doing a little bit as a story where let's say you are in a pub with friends, you get amazing idea for new project, you will do it better than otherwise, it will change the world. And uh, how to do it. Next day you woke up, hopefully you don't have no hangover, and let's move it into future. So I will be talking about different stages of your company from like if you are only one engineer to like one team of engineers and to like big team with multiple engineers and what you should focus on on each stage of your like progress. And how you get to big slow corporate when you try to only implement like cool features to speed up your process. So when you are to only engineers, you engineer into team, you should be focusing really on creating MVP, like minimal valuable project. You shouldn't spend too much time writing 100% coverage test because the idea can change multiple times and you need to start validating this idea with your customers or users. And spending time on custom lean rules or this test can postpone to mode when, the time when you start validating with the users and then you need to change it. For versioning or like deploying these to users, I will use for now only versioning where you just create version from your branch and apply it to upload it to host. Um, for example, I will use TypeScript for this project, React and GitHub repository and Google Cloud platform because it's easy to create a domain and it's easy like to upload a new version of the code really, really fast. So when it starts grows and you have another friend who want to join you as an engineer or you can start hiring another engineers, you should start focusing and investing time into patterns like how to write the code, how to format files, or how to test and provide as much automation automates as possible to speed up the process and simplify the most repetitive task. So what I mean by this uh, formatting, for example, the patterns, let's say you have a colleague who has different style of formatting for his code. He make one line change in his code and you are trying to uh, review his PR. Here is only one file in line change and it's really hard to review it. So therefore we can introduce tools like Prettier or S-Line that can help you with these uh, unifying patterns. It can define rules how the users can uh, work with us functions, let's say there is no switch without the default, so everyone has the same patterns. And uh, if this is validated and tested by, by a script, that means uh, there is no bad cop complaining about this in PR, say you should do it this way or that way, because the script is testing it and telling you like it's wrong. So no, no fights in the kitchen between spaces and tabs in for new lines and so on. Um, for a testing, uh, we can start with the unit test because it's the simplest and fastest, so let's say, for start. We can expect like every engineer should write the test as part of the, his change as the PR because he knows how the code was implemented, what it should do, how it should behave, and it also should aim or like focus on uh, behavior or output testing instead of implementation. So for example, if we are using Jest and there is like a snapshot which is comparing to do elements before and after the change, this test is quite useless because if you change the class name, the test will be screaming, it's something wrong, and we will end up in situation just overwriting this snapshot test and you will never check them again, so just waste of the time. What I mean by focusing on behavior or output is if, for example, you have React component, which after render loads data into table, you should check if the request was fetched only once. After the render, there is no other fetch. If there is a button, you click on it and it do some certain action. And even if you change the class name or you change the position of button, the test is still working. So it's a really efficient test for you. Uh, about the coverage, I don't know if all of you know what it is. It's a tool that can tell you like how much you test your functions or code. If you test many cases, so for example, if there is if condition in your code, so if you test even positive or negative uh, behavior and can tell you like how efficient your tests are. Of course, focusing for 100% coverage doesn't mean your function is the best or like no error can be called because you just wrote function on even broken behavior, you can write this test. 
So aiming for 100% coverage doesn't mean it's like, and you should spend really on behavior you want to achieve. With automation, what I mean was uh, if you open a pull, pull request uh, to merge into master branch or like implementing your change, not directly committing into master branch, we can implement uh, tools. We can use tools like Circle CI or GitHub Actions to check some stuff. We implement this formatting, we implement rules, and we can test it on a code because the engineer who created this change for example, didn't implement this on his uh, editor, didn't use it in editor, so you can still end up in a situation you will have broken UI in a code. Also, you can use tools like Danger.js that it's, uh, can help you define your own custom rules like user didn't update changelog in his PR, or the PR is too big, he updated 100 files, and really, who wants to review 100 big changed files PR, and even how you can feel confident to approve it because it's, it's too big. So we, we, again, we can block these all actions like required and until the author of the PR didn't solve them, PR is not mergeable. So again, no complaining in code or like fighting with engineers on, in comments. Um, so you have your first users, you're getting bigger and bigger. You users are using the application. You are growing to certain point where you have so many engineers and having like one big engineering thing between the engineers doesn't work that well, you will need to split them. And mostly you will split them the way where the, each team is responsible for a specific part of the application. So in this case, it's really important to keep cross-team collaboration and uh, be aligned. This team should be aligned not only from product point of view, but also from engineering one. That means they should discuss how to implement certain features, what is blocking them in implementing it, what is like the timeline, how they can de deploy it, and provide this feedback back to his PM so he is able also like to plan next, next work in different teams or across multiple teams. It can happen you work on one feature and it touch multiple teams, so you can actually you can go to the team code and change it. And if you change it for, to tell this team like, hey, I need to change this, it's, it's really bad and uh, it can happen like multiple things. You can break something in Terascope and they don't know about it and that can just make like bad blood. So how to solve it? You can use code owners. It's a function of GitHub where you can set up like rules, which part of the code is owned by who. So in the GitHub, you can also have a teams and you can say like everyone under this folder is owned by this team. And if you make a change, this team is notified, he need to approve it. And this is beneficial even other way, this team owns this area, they know about this area most, they can provide better feedback, and maybe it's even already done, but you didn't find a way how to do it. So this is like helping even you having like this set up so you are not changing, causing problems and bad blood. You should also improve like your testing because until now we have only unit tests. They are nice, they are testing the code in isolated environment. You are mostly mocking a lot of stuff, you are mocking like used functions inside and you are not testing the whole the whole uh, application itself so it can happen like every test pass everything is fine but you deploy it and application breaks and user cannot log in so therefore you can use tools like cypress where you can set up the whole user flow scenarios from logging to do some certain actions on a page and it will let you know what is changing this cypress test should be also implemented the way as we discuss for unit test it should be uh, behavior, not implementation. So if you change the color of a login button and move it to the front page, it's still working and it's not false positive for you. So then how you want to test how the application really looks like if it's, for example, not broken in a narrow view, because it can happen your team change a padding in the main component and it looks cool in every other page. You never tried in narrow view and this change introduces horizontal scroll for mobile users. And this is really annoying. So for this, we can use tools also like Percy that will be doing snapshot tests and checking all these changes. And for the user, they're providing nice UI where they show like what is the change, how it was moved, and user can just, or engineer can just approve it, or it can ask the designer or fix his issue on this part. Um, with adding all these tests, then we are still assuming it will be part of the checks before merging. Uh, this can get heavy and it can be a lot of tests and testing Every button action on every screen resolution can take a lot of time. And uh, we should really think for implementing this test in case that are really like P1 scenario, P2 scenario, 
because then it can end up, you can end up in a situation you are waiting like hour for your PR is ready to merge. You will open a PR, it will run all checks, it can take hour, you see like you have bug, you need to fix it and you're waiting another hour. So maybe you should really think which tests are like the most important. Then you can also have like set of another test, like this full test running against another environment in, in cron tabs, let's say like once in day, once in hour. So it doesn't mean we need to throw them out, but just thinking what is required for PR, what is required for, for like staging and how, how often to do it. So we can say we basically covered uh, continuous integration. And now we are still using versioning and we heard about continuous deployment. So with versioning, it's quite simple. We can just release version every time we feel confident. We need a fix. We need uh, uh, it for third party stories. There is an exception when we need to still using versions. And it can get tricky from, for example, from support point because the user can call you like, hey, I have this bug. And you ask him on which version is he, and he will tell like, yeah, it's fixed with this version, and this can really complicate the whole process. And if you are not limited by versioning, you can use uh, continuous delivery, where you can actually even automatize this process when every time you make a change, runs every Silco job successfully, you will deploy to customers, and users always probably have the latest versions. So which one is the best? It depends, right? Um, as it can, as it always works in IT, there are some downsides from continuous delivery. Let's say we introduce our first continuous deployment. The deployment, it works smoothly. I made a change, I merge it, and in like one hour or two hours, in with customers and users already using it. But what it also means is. I can really fast the broke whole experience for a user, right? <laughs> so I am broking and pushing the change, which wasn't catched by, by testing all these snapshots or integration tests, and you break the UI. You also have a way how to, eat, relatively fast way to fix it. By the whole same process, you will provide a fix, you will merge it, maybe force merge it, not waiting for all tests. But it's not that efficient, right? And so in this case, maybe we can start thinking about the rings. It can be different environments. It can be like a staging, where staging always get like the newest version. And if staging is say for one day, hour, it depends on us, it can go to internal usage. It can go to another ring where we have users that are really eager for like getting the newest version and they know it can be something broken. But in this process, when we set it up, we have this propagation when every hour day it goes to another ring. We should be able to stop this propagation and we discover error and also be able to revert it back. So we can solve the front end really fast. If you have all users only on one environment, it becomes tricky. Like in this is like you can have two, like go like the previous last working version, you can choose two version. Uh, what is the next? Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, it was too fast. Um, also, with this continuous delivery, we, we agreed, like we will have small PRs, only 20 files will be changed, or 50 files in one PR. So how to deliver big, big feature that you cannot definitely fix, merge into one, one PR? You can go to way like feature branches, where you are pushing everything into branch, someone trying to merge it with master, keep it up to date, and then one big bang to master. But it also breaks the idea of continuous de de deployment or delivery. Because you, you need to maintain manually this whole branch and test it if it's okay or not. So there is another cool thing, it's called feature flex. How many of you know what the feature flag is? That's cool, that's cool. Uh, feature flag is a thing that allows, it's directly implemented into your code and it can turn off and on some specific part of the application. So for example, you are working on a new feature which is under button which opens some super fancy model, you can hide it. You can literally type in code like show this button if the feature flag is on. And these feature flags are controlled from another third service or it can be implemented by you. For this, I will just launch darkly. They have like really multiple environments. You can have a lot of stuff with it. And actually you can even go further and start releasing it by, by rings, by users. You can do ABA testing or even percentage rollout. So you don't go with the new change Big Bang and immediately get everything, but you can start testing. And it can be used even in a way when uh, 
and uh, there is a bug or problem and you have it behind feature flag, instead of reverting the version back, you can just turn off the feature flag. This is much faster, much simpler. Uh, so it sounds like it can replace all rings, right? So I will definitely not recommend that because also the problem can be in a code, it cannot be catched. The feature flag in off state can work wrongly again because if you are refactoring something, it can happen like, hey, this is if it's off, it's a lot of changes and it doesn't work. So it should be just like extra safety guard for, for your changes and confidence to deploy things to, to production. So with great power came great responsibility, right? So what I mean by this is uh, every feature flag creates new version. Right, so if I have uh, one feature flag, I have two versions of my application. If I have two version, feature flags, I have four versions of my application. That's actually expand, like it, it, it grows really fast. And if you end up situation, you have thousand feature flags, you can have really issues in future when combination of this feature flag breaks your application. So you should really keep kind of hygiene. If it's like feature flag, it's releasing new stuff. You should have like timeline how fast to roll it out and then get rid of the feature flag, deprecate it, remove it from the code, so you are not dealing with these uh, issues when combination of flags broke something for someone. Even investigation can be really hard if someone tells you, hey, it doesn't work for me, but it works for my colleague, and how, how you wind it and how you solve it. Um, your application is still growing, and customers are happy, everyone is uh, super excited about it, and then you receive a request from a customer, hey, I would like to, for example, use your application for extension in, in browser. Um, it will improve their experience, they can work even in different tabs, they don't even need to open your application, and it will even move your company forward, let's say. So there is multiple ways how you can do it, because you can also think about in the future, I want to introduce a mobile app based on JavaScript or embedded mode and can be used also outside. So how, how to get it into our code? And we can use multi-repo. That means for every project we have on Git repository, pros are it's a small code base, you are building, testing, uh, deploying only to one project we are working on. Cons are it's disconnected from the whole, whole your environment. If you want to use a UI library in extension, the same style, same design, you don't have it. You need to copy it, you need to replicate it, you need to go by NPM packaging, versioning, and it can get really messy, uh, or you can end up in duplicating the code. The another approach is you can have monolith, what basically probably you have from your start, or monorepo, where actually monorepo is, you have multiple packages or like projects into one repo that are based and used uh, internally, like you can do dependencies on internal project. So you can share, for example, one package can be UI, another package can be uh, tools for formatting date because you want one specific way. And every package is one small piece that is testable, have a coverage test, and it can be used against to it. Uh, also, then you can start adding like these extension projects, mobile products into one repo. The cons of this, it became like a really big, huge code base. And if it's like as it is now, you end up building, testing, and deploying everything. If I change code in extension, I will be building my main application because it's in the same package. We can get rid of it and we can get all pros from, uh, from a single repo to mono repo. And you can do it by using tools like Enix, Lerna, or Turbo Repo. Enix is a Lerna is thing owned by Enix right now, or like maintained. And these tools really can really understand the dependencies between packages. So what I mean this is, if I change UI library, every package using this UI library package will be tested. If I commit, if I do like check, I will run test, it will test only affected packages. So I don't need to test the whole application. In case I change only extension, which is the final level, it will be tested only the extension itself. So this can even improve your, your main project without external projects, because if you have really big code base, you are testing only affected packages. So these tools can really, really help you with this and how to do it. Now we have a lot of customers and we don't know how the application works for them. We can ask them, we can call them, but we really don't have any data. So we should start collecting and see how the application works in the real world. Because 
developers has different uh, set of data he's working on. He has like super new lightest MacBook, which is really fast, and users have different, different software or hardware. How we can do it? We can do it actively. We can ask users, we can call them, ask them how, how it works for them. Are, are we focusing on what we really want? Are you using the new feature the way we, we design it? Or you can send survey email, or you can integrate directly into application uh, tool um, feedback rating or tool guard that can also help. And for this, you can use uh, Pendo that's really helping you and start collecting data by this way. But if it comes to asking like how fast it is for you or how reliable it is for you, it's subjective and we know happy customer, everything's fine. Angry customer, it doesn't work at all. And this will not help us to understand which part is the slow and how it really works. We can do it the other way, like passively. We can start collecting data directly from, from application. Uh, you can do and measure time from the moment you start loading data until you load them, then to continue like how much time it takes to render the data for a user. And you can measure even time, how much time from opening the page it takes to user can see first, first input. And this will be objective data. So we really know how the application is fast, where we have like a, place to, a space to improve. Uh, and we can also check and we can send whatever we need basically. We can even also test how users are clicking on specific button, how often, like which, for example, filters often they are applying and we can sort the filter based on how often the users use them like to improve the UI or activity, daily activities of the users, how many users using the application daily, weekly, and so on. These data alone are not that much useful. We can look at them, but we need to somehow aggregate them. What we can do, we can create the dashboards. Uh, as for, we can use Datadoc for collecting data for dashboards and also for monitors. And we can visualize them in, in uh, dashboards. Then I mean, we can have aggregate value, like one big value in a dashboard, like for success rate. That means how many requests for loading data were successfully. And then we see if it's 99, it's correct, it's fine. Uh, we can also see how much time it takes to show data. It can be seconds, it can be 10 seconds. This can help us to detect problems. We can detect problems even before user call us because until now, until introducing this uh, telemetry, this data and monitoring, if something happened in the user side, on the user side, we have to wait until they call us and tell us, hey, this doesn't work for us, it's broken. And we don't know what is broken and it takes like whole process. But now when we have this data, we can see the success rate, for example, significantly drop down. This can be caused by new feature which breaks it for everyone. And thanks to this, we can even start solving this issue immediately before even customers start calling us and solve the issue really fast. We can also detect anomalies uh, where, for example, daily usage drops down because also if users cannot use this application, there is no error, right? So even looking on success rate itself without how many users is usually using it, don't tell you it's not broken. Well, I can tell you in some cases, but not in most of all cases. When we have all these, uh, set up, we, can, we, we don't want to watch these monitors like all the time, we go to flange, we go to sleep, and we need some, some tools or something that will notify us that something happened. So for the, this thing, we can introduce or like implement monitors. It's also part of the data doc, where we can set up simple rules. If this success rate drops under 80%, send a warning message to Slack or something, and it drops under 50%, trigger like messages, or we can use pager duty, which is like, software then is used for on-call services, they will call you on the phone even if you are midnight, like it's, you can have it on the phone and it will really trigger you. So you can keep all promises for customers like to keep these SLAs and everything and you know about the problem as, first, as, as soon as possible so there is no delay, no problems with it. And I have something more. Yeah, and, and one nice thing even, if it is monitors, we can even link them to, for example, feature flags if we have big feature, we plan it like for a long time, we can even link it to feature flag. And if the success rate drops down, we can just turn on immediately feature flags, not even wake up anyone. So there is a lot of things you can do with this monitoring. It can really help you to, to provide and deliver the code to your users. So what we tried just was like to improve our process, like how to deliver things, how and why we introduce certain uh, tools. And now we have everything what like big companies have. We have visual testing, monitoring. So that's end of this presentation. I'll show you a few references so you can look and check them by yourself. And yeah, that's it. Before we finish, do you have any questions?
Yes? Are you using continuous delivery or, or if not, how many environments do you use and which are the purpose of which environment do you have? Okay, uh, we are using both versions actually. We are using versioning and continuous delivery or deployment. Because, for example, the add-ons, it's third-party stores, you need to upload it to Chrome store or Google store. So for these cases, you need uh, versioning. But for main application, we are using continuous deployment and we have multiple rings. The main one is, uh, like the first one is a staging. Uh, from the staging, it goes after some time, if it's okay, we are also running tests, as I mentioned, this old test in end-to-end uh, -end testing running against the staging, not uh, in build. So if this everything is correct, we, we go to another ring like internal usage, then another set of users, and, and there is like one more ring. It depends on your project, how big it is, how much you want to scale it. And even if you have many rings, you call it, uh, it even many rings, the idea should be it goes from ring to ring. So if you have 10 rings and it goes to last ring, uh, to next ring every day, it takes 10 days to get it to last ring. So it's really based on your confidence, how your changes are done, how your testing is correct or like solid and it's not causing you problems. If it's causing problems, we maybe can slow down. I will not recommend fully slow down like once a week because then you have a lot of change at calls going to customers. So the recommendation will be try to find what is breaking your experience. Then just slowing down process because then you start deploying big, big changes at the same time. So going with small pieces, even the feature flag, if you have no big feature implemented and you are going like part by part, you see if it's not broken, even if it's not fully enabled. And the last part was what? Environments. Uh, yes, but... Okay, cool. Me. Yes? Do you actually use the per se for the visual testing? How, how, how much flake yeah. is it? <laughs> yeah, we are using it and it's actually it's stable. Uh, only issue we have is because we are testing on some environments and we have sometimes not everything is properly mocked. You can throw error message and then the error message is actually like flaky. But I don't have any issues like with PRs. It's really rarely, mostly when we change something. We own core piece like table system and we can see immediately I broke it for users. If we are not owning users part, but we can really see it.